We are recording and live. Wonderful. Great. Well, good morning. I just muted myself by mistake. <laughs> so we're all new to this a little bit. So we'll see how it goes. Welcome to our first virtual Marblehead Memories meeting. We want to keep this monthly tradition going despite our, uh, our being stuck at home. So we appreciate you braving the technology to join us. Um, as you know, this month's theme is, is about working and being on the waterfront, but it's a very loose theme. So any um, memories you have, any stories you want to share, we're excited to hear them. Before we get started, um, I do want to make sure I thank National Grand Bank, our signature sponsor for all of the Marblehead Memories Project. Um, and also the Marblehead Cultural Council has helped out uh, in one of our upcoming projects. So we're super appreciative of that and all your support, of course. We have a few technical things uh, that Jack's gonna go over so that we can uh, try to keep this going and make sure everybody gets a chance to say what they wanna say. So Jack, if you don't mind taking over on the technical. Yes, um, the new normal is, this is how we get together for now, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's good that we have the technology to get together. Um, uh, this type of meeting, this Zoom platform, has been hacked uh, quite a few times. You've probably read about it in the news. Um, and I had a friend that had a Zoom meeting on Facebook Live yesterday, and all of a sudden she was hacked and pornography showed up. So that's why we have a, a, a multi-layered uh, system going on here. I'm going to be doing mostly the production, um, and if the meeting ends and without any um, explanation, you'll know that it was because we've been hacked. Um, I, I'm going to do my best to to monitor everything um, as we're moving along. If you go down to, um, I think it says participants, right, Lauren? If you go to, if you click on the the button that says participants on the bottom. Um, you'll see a screen that pops up mm -hmm. and and there's a in that screen that pops up there's a place where you can raise your hand um, we know once we get conversations going that that people want to participate and if you could either raise your hand through there or uh, if for some reason you can't find that or I don't see you just you know raise your hand or um, or speak up sometimes people have background noise so at, at times people might be muted um, and I'll turn you back on, or you can turn yourself back on uh, from the from the muted place. And uh, what I'm going to try to do is, I the, let me see here. I know that this works on Facebook Live, anyways. But am I the only one on your screen right now? No. Okay. So I'm the only one on the screen on Facebook Live right now. So we're not going to lose. Um, we're not going to share anything horrible with uh, with Facebook Live anyways, if somebody hacks into us. So bear with us. If you have any questions along the way, click the raise your hand button. And other than that, I'll hand it back to Lauren. Um, and here we go. Wonderful. Thanks, Jack. All right. Here's hoping we don't get hacked. All right. So I'm going to invite um, Norm. I understand you might have some stories to share with us this morning, and I'm excited to hear them if you want to get, get us going. You are currently muted. Oh, I'll, I'll unmute you. Hold Jack on, I'll, I'll take you. care of it. Is this okay? Are you okay to go, Norm? Oh, Okay, Jack's gonna try unmuting you. Hold on one second. Awkward. Okay, for some reason, I cannot unmute oh. Norm Cressy, and that kills me. I just oh, got no. to <laughs> that you unmuted me. Oh. So, oh, oh there we go. go, Norm. Norm, we have you. And and Norm, you can only speak if you if you tell the story about where your first loft was. <laughs> Norm, it's all yours. Okay. No, well, I'm Norm Cressy, and, and I was in the sail making business. As Jack, I'll start off, Jack. My first sail loft was upstairs where Tony's Pizza is now, the old building burned down some years ago. Um, but I rented that in 1961 from Jack's, is that your uncle? Bob Osborne? Hello? Jack, you're muted. My grandfather was bowed and oh, his but, dad but, was Norris. Okay, so I, I rented that third floor on Three School Street from Bob Osborne. 
$50 a month and no heat. And we started the sale making business. But I'm going to give you a little bit of maybe sale making history that I know of around Marblehead. And I have an item that Bill Connolly gave me some years ago of a sale off between 1852 and 1902. It was called the Graves Sale Lot. And I have a picture that he gave me. And on the bottom it says, second floor sale lot, Russell family. Graves Sale Lot, 1852 to 1904. So that's one item I have. I have an old newspaper clipping here by, remember, Harry Wilkinson. And he speaks of a sale making business of a John A. Simmons. And it was at 15 State Street, where I believe Maddie's is now. And in behind there, at one time, where Maddie's is and that parking lot, Eventually, and I remember this man that took over, his name was Parsons, Charlie Parsons. And he died at about um, 1950. And Ted Hood, when he was just starting, I gather, used some of Charlie Parsons' space and maybe machines and that sale off was in behind Maddie's. That's a, maybe that's how Maddie's got Maddie's sale off. But, but Charlie Parsons, I barely remember him. Now going forward, or maybe backward a little bit, about 1946, there was a company in Boston, Wilson and Silsby Sailmakers. Very famous sail making business on Atlantic Avenue. They made sales for like the J boats in the 1930s for the America's Cup. And then they obviously, during the Second World War, they did a lot of government contract work, canvas work for the, for the government. So about 1946 or 47, this man, Stan Hayes, and he was some relative of the original Mr. Silsby, Wilson and Silsby sailmakers. But Stan Hayes from Winthrop came down and brought that sailmaking business down to 89 Front Street at the Gray's Boat Yard, where the Four Peak is now upstairs on that second floor was Wilson and Silsby Sailmakers, owned by a man, Stan Hayes, who moved his family from Winthrop to Beverly, and he had five sons. Now, I'll go just a little bit that his five sons and myself, we all hung around and sailed at the Jubilee Yacht Club when we were 10, 12, 14, 18 years old. So that's how I originally, myself, got interested in the sail making business. Now, a little story is, I can recall Mr. Hayes, or Stan Hayes, have, have I lost you? I've lost you. No, no, we got you. We can hear you, but there's... Um... Okay, I have a picture of him. Oh, perfect. Okay, here we are. So Stan Hayes, he did have a, a weak elbow, I'll say. And I can remember as a kid coming over to 89 Front Street up in that sail lock, and he'd be sitting on the bench and he'd say, Cressy, here's some money. Go get me Coca-Cola. I'd go down to, I guess Jack was at Sal Salty Sam's where, where the landing is now. Get me Steve, some Steve, Steve Willard spoke about Salty Sam's when we, when we had our last meeting. So, so he would give me some money. I'd, go, I'd bring him back home. He'd, he'd mix himself a, bit, a drink on the bench, probably rum. Unfortunately, he died at about 52 years of age of cirrhosis of the liver. He was quite a character. But Stan Hayes and Wilson and Silsby sailmakers. Now, I'll go back to myself a little bit. 
that's how I kind of got introduced to it. Ted Hood started his sailmaking business around 1950, 51, somewhere around there. And I have the book of the Ted Hood book and there's stories in there that he laid out some of his sails on the dance floor of the Corinthian Yacht Club. I believe in the old, um, I'm trying to think of Boatyard, the man's with a Swedish name. Uh, anyway, so there was a boatyard um, and he made some of his sales there. And eventually Ted started down on Little Harbor. And with Ted there and his father, they started that sailmaking business. And Ted got into that business just at the right time in that the industry was converting from canvas and cotton sales to Dacron and synthetic sales. So all the sailmakers, the sailmakers that had been in business for years and years and years, all over the country, had used, this was a new medium, a new product. So Ted Hood started off just like Ratsy Sailmakers and other big sailmaking companies around the country. And he started and with the synthetic say, cloth and eventually they started making their own fabric. I can recall those looms. Ted's father, um, they bought the looms from the old Pequot mills over in Salem and they converted those old looms to make Daquan fabric. And I can picture Ted's father and he had a man his name was Karen, Tony Karen, from the old mills over there in Salem, and he ran the mill, and he and Ted's father wove the original hood um, Daquan sail fabric. Um, so obviously, Ted, uh, when I when I went to work there, I went to work at Hood Sailmakers in 1959, um, and at that time. There were about three or four stitches. One woman, Gertrude Nickerson, I can picture her to this day. And Gertrude and about three or four stitches, one or two other fellows, myself, there were maybe eight employees at Hood Sailmakers. And in those days, you were on your hands and knees, I would roll the cloth across the floor to Ted, he would cut it, turn the roll around, roll it back to me. We'd strike it off with a pencil back and forth, sit down, sew it, and it was a step-by-step -step process. And there were only a few of us, and when the sale was about ready to be completed, you sat there on a bench. I still have my, my sailmaker's palm. We sat on the bench, and you sewed on the rings, and you sewed on the slide, and I can picture, it would take about a day. This is when the America's Cup was starting again. The days of um, Columbia and Easterner and those boats, when, when America's Cup in the 12 meters began uh, that series again. And you would hand rope the, the boat rope across the foot and up the left of the entire sail, and you had to do it nonstop. And you, <laughs> Ted would be there and he'd start you in the morning and you would sit there down, down the leech or maybe 18 inches across the foot all the way up the left of the sail and you would hand stitch and you had to do the tension of the rope in the sail exactly. He'd take a look at that and if anybody ever knew Ted Hood, he was a man of few words. He would string the sail up, look, and you go, mm, 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 mm. You knew you did it right, or you had to go back and start all over again and, and, and re rope that sail. Um, so that was um, with, with Ted Hood. I, I was there. I, I went to work. I actually go back. I dropped out of college. I, that was not for me. That was not for me. And I told my family, I'm going to go to work for Ted Hood and be a sailmaker. And because I was very much involved in sailing, I was a I raced a lot as a young boy and got involved in the sailing. So I went to work for Ted Hood and I told my family, 
when I graduate from college, or when my class graduates from college, I'm going to, at that same time, when all my friends are graduating from college, I'm going to start my own sailmaking business. And, and that didn't go over well with my family, but I did it. So in the spring of 1961, I went down again to Bowd Osborne. I rented that building on the third floor of the old building, $50 a month, no heat. And I had, I had the original sign that we hung in that building and I follow Ralph Halsman, who was a policeman here for years in Marblehead. He, I have the bill of sale, $15 he charged me to paint that sign. And it now hangs in my son Eric's living room. I did have help putting that sign up. A very famous Marblehead man, kind of a local uh, town character. Clarence Doan. <laughs> Everybody in here of Clarence Doan, a real town character. Myself and my friend were putting the sign up, and there's Doney out in the middle of School Street, half in the bag as usual. <laughs> no, put the sign here, put the <laughs> that was one of my helpers, Clarence Doan, putting that sign up. <clears throat> so we had the sale. Uh, the sailmaking business, <clears throat> and it moved on. My particular sailmaking business moved along, and we mainly were involved in small boat one design racing sails. I never got into like America's Cup. A lot of one design town class roads, 19s, 110s, 210s, and made sails for one design classes, not just here in Marblehead. We had customers in Hawaii. In the Virgin Islands, we made sales for people in New Orleans and Chicago and San Francisco in the one design classes. In my sailmaking business, as it grew, along came and I hired David Curtis. And David Curtis, obviously, through the years became a very famous sailor and sailmaker. And he and I had Cressy and Curtis sailmakers for a number of years had a sail in the loft on School Street. We built a place on Anderson Street. And the final place that we built was where Ryan Marine is now on Lincoln Avenue. David Curtis and I built that building. Part, as time went by, I hired another young guy, Robbie Doyle. Robbie Doyle was going to Harvard, uh, was a friend of ours. Robbie Doyle came to work for me. Uh, and worked for just in the summers, a couple summers. And then when he graduated from Harvard, he was going to go to um, medical school. His father was a doctor, but instead he went to work for Ted Hood. And Robbie went to work for Ted Hood, and the rest is history. He stayed there and uh, eventually left, started his own sailmaking business, a very, very successful business. And as time went by, at about my age, 30, uh, 58, 59 years old, 35 years in the sailmaking business, I said, what am I gonna do with this business? I was interviewed by some companies, national companies that wanted a place in Marblehead. I said, no, I know Robbie, I know Janet, I know the kids, we're all good friends. I sold my business to Robbie Doyle. So what comes around goes around. I went to work for Robbie and and um, uh, told him I'd stay for five years. I stayed for almost eight years. Another person that I hired as time went by, Cressy Sales, this young boy, Judd Smith. Juddy came to work for me. And to this day, Judd is obviously a world-class sailor, um, Rolex Yachtsman of the Year. So out of that little sailmaking business came David Curtis, Robbie Doyle, uh, Judd Smith, uh, Yachtsman's of the Year, World Class. We've won a lot of, between the four of us, national and world, no Olympics. We haven't, none of us have won the Olympics, but every one of us have won 
especially those other three guys, more than I have, but all of us have won some kind of a world, a national, a regional championship through the years. Norman, was it competitive? <laughs> I mean, you guys were all in the same town making sales. What was it like? You know, the nice thing was, the nice thing was, when I had my sale making business and I'd get a call from Ted Hood and he'd say, no, I left there on very good terms with Ted. So that he and I were always the best of friends. It'd be a Thursday afternoon. Norm, do you have any yellow 1.5 ounce spinnaker cloth? I said, yeah, I got a, a hundred yard roll here. I'll, I'll send somebody over and get it. But was that, it was always that way. Or if I needed some, plus you also got, uh, by the way, there's some guy coming over to, wants to order some sales. Norm, it'd be Ted Hood. I'll give you some advice. Don't do business with him. <laughs> Don't do business with that guy. It was a, now, let me go on. If, I, if I'm going too long, let me know. But. Norm, we'll give, you, we'll give you a couple more minutes for sure, but um, I, wanna, I wanna show you this old picture that um, I believe was either 36 or 38. Um, oh, yeah. uh, oh, the J-boats. The J-boats in Marblehead Harbor. Yes, I've seen that picture, yes. It's one of my favorites. And uh, I know we had, I had Bruce Dyson um, identify some of them, but you can see the steamer in the middle um, that's actually the, the towboat for the one that, that she's pulling, which is, which is pretty cool. These, yeah, these guys yeah. showed up with, uh, with quite an uh, a accompaniment of, of other boats. Oh, and yes. And, plenty and of money. And, and what amazed me when I was talking with Bruce about all this was that most of these boats were built during the Depression. Yes. Well, you know, the Depression, 20% of the people out of work were out of work. But there was an 80% of the people were still working and there was still a lot of money around. A lot, those guys had a lot of. But let me just, just quickly, the interesting thing here in Marblehead, at one time, when Ted Hood was the only one making sales, and I think I was the first one to start my own business. But over a period of time, oh, excuse me, there was also Wilson and Silsby sale makers. So there's three. Then along came a company, O'Connor and Milgram, followed Bob O'Connor. Then along came Milgram and Hopkins. Then along came Jeff Anderson and Viking, Vining, Fred Vining. Frazier Sailmakers, Sobsted Sailmakers, North Sailmakers, Ralph DeLuca, Bill Willem, Mass Bay Sailmakers, Dyson Sailmakers, Ralph Halsman, Sales East. Um, maybe that was it. There were like 10 sailmakers in here in Marblehead all at once. How about Jeff, Jeff Howlett? Well, Jeff Howlett and, and, and uh, was at Wilson and Silsby Sailmakers. Yep. But he was at Wilson and Silsby Sailmakers. There were like 10, 10 or 12 sailmakers in Marblehead. This was in the 60s and 70s. How the hell we all survived, I don't know. But I was fortunate that I had a business that we made sales for people all over the country because we made one design sales. If we won an event in, in the Lightning class or the Rhodes 19 class, people that had a Rhodes 19 in Chicago ordered sales from us. So we, we were, had, a, had a special niche. But maybe that's, I hope I haven't gone on too long. No, that's great, uh, Norm. That's great. Try and, and I have this information and pass it on. You know, I'll, I'll tell you what's, what's amazing is that, you know, Chris Hood is still b building boats. J.B. Braun is still doing real high level design work. Um, Doug Zern's doing a, a lot of business. Um, I mean, it's, it's amazing how much, how much of the boat industry we've retained, um, given the fact that most everything is has been exported. So that's true. Yeah. 
Thank you. We have a question. The other, excuse me, the other waterfront industry that has a great history here in Marblehead that somebody should talk about sometime is the boat designers from mm. Burgess to Ted Hood to, to so many, Carl Alberg to Doug Zern, the number of naval architects, Dita M. Packer. Um, oh, the Boston Whaler. <laughs> but pardon me? The Boston Whaler. Yeah, Ray Hunt. Ray Hunt. Ray Hunt was here. That, that's, a, that's an interesting story just in itself. The number of famous boat designers. Norm, uh, Maureen has a question. I'm sorry, Maureen. Well, it's not really a question. I just want to say uh, you kind of sold yourself short about what a fantastic sailor you were. I crewed for years for Fred Brehod and competed against <laughs> you uh, in the Rhodes 19. But I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the Graves sail off because that was my great, great, great grandfather, Philip Graves, who had that. Um, in the really old days, back in the time of the revolution, um, the Graves were also sail makers, but they were based on board ships for the most part. You know, they would sail on the ships. But I know John Graves during the revolution actually converted to making tents for Washington during the siege of Boston. So that was kind of interesting. But I'll tell a little bit about the demise of the Graves law, loft, uh, which was down at Tucker Wharf. That building is now over in Salem. And Dan Dixie had a receipt from the Graves loft. Towards the end, Marble, you know, Marblehead's shoe business, you know, had had some problems and Marblehead was very much in transition. And he decided there was no money in sail making, especially in yachts. You know, yachts were going nowhere. That was a dead business. So he went into wagon covers uh, instead. And we can see he made the wrong decision. <laughs> His loft was not around for very many more years after that. And he faded away. <laughs> Can That's you, all I wanted to say on that. Can you see if I hold this picture up? Um, can, can, can oh, you, is that you got to li yeah, lift it up higher. a little bit more. Lift it up so a little bit higher, the Norm. The Russell family reunion in 19 whatever. Not close, Norm, not closer, but higher. Pull it back. Yeah, that, yeah. perfect. 19, yeah, he was involved in um, the Russell family and the Besson family genealogy stuff. And he used his loft. Uh, to have a big family reunion and it was in all the papers and I believe that's a picture of the inside of the loft when they had one of their family reunions. Okay. I'd love to get a copy of that picture or see it well, a little bit better. I can get this too. Um, it's interesting. See, I thought, plus it says on the bottom here, second floor sail loft, Russell family. Yep. And see, when I looked at that picture and said to myself, look at those are all the employees. No. <laughs> no. No, it was a big, a big party they had there okay. for, for the descendants of Lewis Russell. 1904, that picture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got that from Bill Connolly. You oh, know, good. You know, yeah. he could give you that picture. I have a question actually for you, Norm, if you don't okay. mind. Maybe this is ignorant from someone who doesn't know anything about sail making, but did you ever move from hand sewing to machine sewing? Um, well, we... I never was, we never made sales hand stitching the seams. Oh, you know, I see. You always had a machine. Now I would say that the hand sewing of the machines, of, of the sales were definitely in the 1930s. And I've seen pictures of like Ratsy Sail Lock, which was down in New York. And they were making sales for the America's Cup boats, like those big J boats. Those sails were completely stitched by hand, every single wow. seam. And I've seen pictures of these guys lined up sewing these. When I got involved, no, it was all machine stitching of the seams, but still a lot of hand stitching. You hand sewed on the hooks and the okay. slides and the rings and the headboards. It did all of that by hand. And as time would, I mean, you saw some sails that were made and somebody stamped in a headboard. You say, oh, Yes, isn't that cheap? Isn't that terrible? But <laughs> where today, every, there's no real hand stitching anymore. Some. Okay. So, so the occupational hazards often were bad knees and bad back from creeping around on the floor. So how are your knees and back? Well, that's a good <laughs> question. My knees, I never wore knee pads. 
<laughs> 25 years I was on my hands and knees walking. <laughs> Never worn knee pads and they're, they're great, they're fine. I, but you know, you're on your hand, you actually all spent all day on your hands and knees. Yep. Laying That's on the, awesome. cutting the sails by hand. Wow, thank chalk, you so much. With chalk, string, thumbtacks. That's how you made the sales. <laughs> there was no computer, no digital things, nothing all run, run you know, with a, uh, my computers. It was all done. By, and, uh, and the sail design, when I did it, you had a piece of paper and pencil. And you mm -hmm. said, this is the left, the leech, the foot. We're going to put so much curve in. And I don't know, you, you really winged it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we did it. We did awesome. it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I getting us started. Go on too long. Oh, you're great. No, that was great, Norm. So, oh, yep. who designs all the sails for the for the model boats down at Red's Pond? I don't know who does that. I've never been involved. I don't know who. Does. I'm probably some company that specializes yeah. in making those sails for those model boats. I've never. I was always curious about that. Don't don't know. So that could be a good business, Norm, with an exacto knife and a, <laughs> yeah. and a small roll of fabric. You off. could be all set. Yeah, they're all synthetic of yeah. some sort. They're, they're, obviously, they're not cotton <laughs> silk. They're all synthetic. I've never gotten made any of those or anything like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. So, any questions or comments before we go to the next person? I don't see anybody raising a hand right now. Don't forget if you ever want to chime in with anything, you can click on participants and click on raise hand. Um, Val, can I ask you to um, share the stories that you brought, that you have with you? <laughs> I'm trying to unmute Val. Hold on one second, we're gonna unmute you here. Come on. One second. There okay. you go. You're all good, Val. Oh, hold on. I'm I can only do it by unmuting everybody. So if we can keep the background mute, uh, noise down, that'd be great. Val, you're on. <laughs> Val, are you there? What are they trying to get? Looks like Frank Owen is trying to come on. Frank the, is here, uh, but he's probably called in, is my yeah. guess. Val, Go can on. you hear oh. us? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we can hear you. Uh, we cannot hear you. Okay, hold on one second. Let's try to figure out what's going on. Frank is there. You got me? Yeah, we Yeah, we you, got Frank. you, Val. Can you hear Frank me now? And yes. And we got we have Val and Frank. <laughs> okay, Val, you're on. <laughs> I think Val might have frozen there. I think we froze, yeah. Okay, well while we wait for Val to get back to us or unfreeze. <laughs> Um, Frank, did you have anything you wanted to share? Sure. Can you hear Great. me now? We can hear you. Well, I noticed Betsy Morris's picture coming up, and my story was about <laughs> the best year of my life, working hand in hand with her father, Pat, on the yacht Plany. It was the summer of 1960, the last year that the Pleone would sail out of Marblehead, and it was uh, the greatest opportunity a young guy could ever experience. I got to race six other New York 50s that summer, along with L. Francis Harrishoff and Augie Nielsen. They were crew members on board with us. And we got to spend a few weeks at the Mystic Seaport Museum before the donation took place. The United States Coast Guard Academy ship, the Eagle, donated its figurehead to the museum. And it's at the entrance as you walk in. We were there for that celebration. And later on that year, we sailed her down for her last voyage. And she, that's where she <clears throat> stayed until Mr. Santry's death. But to get the job, I started at 
around 10 years old, going down to the Graves lofts in the winter, in the early spring, actually, late April, and pestering Jesse's father, Pat, into letting me help him in hopes that one day I'd be able to get the job as a crew member on the what I thought was the finest boat in the harbor. So I'd work there until June, helping him sand hatches and rails and masts and booms and anything that needed sanding and learned the art of varnishing and painting through him. And I did that from the time I was 12, 13, 14, 15 every year. Finally, in the spring of 1960, he says, well, I guess I got to hire you. Just the problem this year is that it's only going to be you and me. But it turned out to be the very best year of my whole life. We spent on board that ship, there was 186 pieces of deck brass. And because it was going to be the last year sailing out of Marblehead, we made many day trips. Mr. Santry wanted to share it with pretty much anybody that wanted a free ride on it on the boat with him. Every time we went out for sale, that meant at the end of the day, we had to have that brass, all 186 pieces shined up for the next morning. <laughs> and it was just Pat and I, and that was a lot of work. But the day she started, we were at the, the, the day that the family left, we were at the end of the harbor and it was flat calm. Mr. Santry was at the home. We had every bit of sail flying. And he was very disappointed that we were going to have to motor out. So we dropped anchor and we came about and all of a sudden the winds picked up. And by the time we hit the Eastern Yacht Club, we were doing 10 knots. So it was like a hurricane, all the boats chasing us. They had a couple of fire boats spraying um, an arch for the, for the boat. But by the time we hit the lighthouse, our rail was buried right under the water. We no sooner around the lighthouse and it went flat calm again. We had to motor all the way down to the Cape Cod Canal. So the gods were out there and they, they gave her her fancy trip out. I'll tell you, it was the greatest experience you could have ever imagined. And um, when we got to Mystic Seaport for the final trip, Pat and I lived there for pretty much a month, getting it ready, getting the top sides all cleaned up and the rails all revarnished and the above and below deck brass all polished. And we got to meet the family, husband and wife couple that owned a school ship called the Albatross and she sailed out of Mystic Seaport. Mr. Santry had offered, asked me if I ever thought of uh, Kings Point and I explained that I hadn't taken the right courses in high school so that was out of the question. He says, well, you'll take a PG. And I said, well, I don't think I could afford to do that. And he says, well, I'm going to pay for it. How'd you like to go on the Albatross? And that was a school ship we limited to about 15 students. And you'd spend a year in sailing and you had almost one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And I was all set to go on the next season, which Mr. Santry was paying for. When it met its demise, it was hit by a white squall of West Indies. And uh, that went down. That was the pretty much the end of uh, my career <laughs> on the water. So Hi you, guys, you, went out, you went out in style, that's for sure, Frank. I certainly did. It was the greatest experience a young man could ever have. And, uh, Betsy's father was by far one of the best, best seamen I've ever met. And uh, he told me some of the greatest stories. He ran away from home on Nova Scotia at 14 to, to go off on a coastal schooner. And they wrote a book about him to the South Seas when he celebrated his 21st birthday in Tahiti. I've lost track of that book, but I, I did get to read it. And um, 
the, the thing that I didn't learn until very late in life, he was the first cousin to trim robots. So uh, the world gets very small. But that's my story about the Pleone. And it was funny. very sad to see that uh, Mr. Santry left a very large endowment for the perpetual care of that boat and to keep three college age people employed born in the summer. But the museum discovered a loophole in the contract and they stole the money to restore the Gloucester schooner. They painted all the deck brass dado brown. They let the top sides go. The decks were soft pine and they let them go. Oh. Mr. Santry had his chauffeur drive him in to see the boat one day and saw the demise and he couldn't believe it. So he wrote in his will that upon his death, the boat would be taken out into the London Sound and sunk. And that's what happened. The transom ended up somewhere at the binnacles at the Eastern Yacht Club. I think the transom is at Mystic Seaport. Wow. So I was told the, the story that that the uh, that the transom that the transom was burnt and or, or destroyed because because that was uh, in accordance with the will. But that that could be folklore too. I'm not certain, but I was told that it's hanging on in one of the buildings at Mystic. But you could you could be right. We have so um, family members uh, got me uh, the house flag and the two life rings that uh, were sewn on either side of the rigging. Wow! Oh, nice. So, nice, Frank. We so have a, a I, I, comment or a question from from Betsy herself, I believe. If you want to, Betsy, in. yeah, go ahead. Frank, thank you for that wonderful story. And yes, I am Betsy Morris, but I'm not the Betsy Morris that you're telling the story about. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I was hoping you were. I saw that and I, I tickle in my heart. I, um, but um, that's all right. I was talking to her. <laughs> it's still a wonderful, wonderful story. And can, I'm curious what. Uh, Mr. Harishoff was like, do you have any fun stories about him? He was the, oh, he was the biggest character you could ever imagine. I, um, I went to the same school Norm Cressy went to. We went, we went to a, Babson College had a school for um, special needs students. And I, we both went to a Miss Midwest Institute out in Eureka, Kansas. And, um, I just wanted to make that comment that um, <laughs> both of us started off at BAPS and both of us ended up doing totally different things than what we started off doing. <laughs> I ended up so after nice. getting out of BAPS, going back to work at Graves Boatyard and ended up running their fiberglass boat operation and uh, did it and loved it and thought I'd spend the rest of my life doing it until my doctor told me my nasal passages had gotten destroyed from all the fiberglass that I'd been sucking in walking around in the plant. So I ended up leaving that business and going into the industrial air filtration business. But going back to Mr. Harishoff, we at Graves, he designed a kayak, which Dan Dixie has a picture of him in Marblehead Harbor, in one of those kayaks. And I, I don't know how many, we, we made probably a few hundred of them while I was there. But John Abbott and his wife who lived on Priest Island had each had one and they used to love to paddle down to Manchester by the sea for lunch but coming back it was quite a chore so they had me cut a hole and put an outboard well and they bought a trolling motor from Sears and Robux with a battery and, and they they would uh, paddle down and and power back um, in their Harishoff kayak but he was, he was the greatest character. He was a, a very generous man. He was uh, always willing to share all his information with you if you were willing to listen. I got to spend all kinds of time with him in the castle over the years as a result of my ability to uh, bunk with him on board the uh, Cleone. But uh, as another as interesting character is uh, Augie Nielsen. He uh, was quite an amazing yacht designer in his own right. But um, both of those were characters in their own way. 
and uh, I would have had I not worked on the schooner, I would have never met or had the opportunity to spend the time that I did with them. But uh, great, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. I love I'll, it. I'll, I'll share one other short story. My uh, the, the way I got involved in the water because you mentioned Salty Sam's. <laughs> when when I uh, my cousin, Kenneth Glass, the Glass family moved to Circle Street in the late 40s. So starting in the early 50s, Joe Lozier used to let my cousin Kenny and I set up a lemonade stand on his walk in front of his house. So we'd, we'd sell lemonade to people walking up and down Front Street and popcorn. And with the money, would would earn, would go down to the transportation company a couple days a week and rent a skiff and row down to the mud flats and go flounder fishing. And that's when we got to know people like Odie Millmore and, and um, that became one of our hangouts. It was like halfway between the transportation company and our lemonade stand. So over the years, that's what that's where we started to get interested in, in working on the water. One of the first to hire us was uh, Watson Curtis, but the deal was first, first kids to the boat in the morning would be the ones that would get to go out. So we'd end up getting up at three o'clock in the morning to be down at the dock to get to go out and go fishing for breakfast. That was our pay. And at Salty Sam's, it was a donut, 10 cents a piece, two for a quarter. And uh, of course, he never charged, he never charged that, but that's what the sign said. And Curtis would always always say, "Well, I'm buying you hot chocolate, and I'm buying you two of those donuts, and they cost me a quarter." <laughs> so, and that was basically our pay for a day's work of, of hard sweat. Once in a while, it'd slip us a dollar. So it wasn't long for me to realize that working on the yachts was a much better deal than working on the fishing boats. <laughs> sounds, sounds like it. <laughs> Wonderful. So, thank you, Frank. That's my story. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay, Val, we have you back. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go for okay. it. Okay, I had I had a computer problem. Um, my story is basically pretty simple. My grandfather, Roy Peach, um, sometimes known as Tug, was um. Is born in 1898, the year of the great um, loss of the Marblehead fishing fleet. His father and his one remaining sibling at the time, his 12-year-old brother, were lost at sea before he was born. So he was raised in Marblehead in eighth grade. He, uh, he had to go to work after eighth grade to support his widowed mother. And uh, he went into the yachting business and ultimately for the before the depression and through the depression he worked for uh mr mcquestion on the on the neck who had a 125 foot yacht that just prior to prohibition had been gutted and uh sailed to uh, nova scotia to fill the entire boat with english gin canadian whiskey etc cetera, etc cetera and uh, sailed that back and had his own private liquor stash at Osborne store. <laughs> and then, as Jack knows, the liquor was all down in the basement, the four foot, four and a half foot high basement. Um, That's right. So anyways, my grandfather skippered for him. Oh, I don't know until George, it wasn't George. I can't remember. George was his son and uh, was a banker. Not a banker. He was on all these boards. You know, I remember him from shopping at Orsman's. He always said, "Huh, George McQuestion? McQuestion. Yeah. Uh, Frank. Frank. Okay, Frank. That's right. And uh, any event, my grandfather then went to work for Mr. Anderson from Boston, and uh, he had a ship called the Valkyrie. Now the Valkyrie participated in the annual Marblehead to Halifax race, but being a 77 footer, uh, it had quite a time handicap. And, uh, and I can't remember, I don't know the exact year, but he had a crew that was mostly Marbleheaders 
included Tom Coffey, uh, my uncle Spike Bassett, uh, and my two uncles, uh, Roy and John Peach, and R Roy Peach Jr. and John Peach. And they, uh, they won the they won the uh, the cop, and they they sailed up there, and they were ahead. But to make it in on time, they would have had to cross an area that was shoals, and you couldn't obviously couldn't cross it at low tide. And they were right at the peak, uh, right between low and high tide. And my grandfather turned to Mr. Anderson and said. We can make this through, I think, but if we don't, we're going to tear the bottom out of the boat. And so they sailed in and uh, they won the cup. And uh, then they came back and I, I spent one summer on there before they, before they were, I was old enough to, to be sailing because you had to be 14 to be a crew on that one. And, uh, then the, my grandfather retired, and, uh, and that, that's my basic sea story for, you know, my, my, gra my grandfather was offered two jobs when he got out of eighth grade, work in a shoe factory or to uh, be, work for the yachting people. He couldn't become a fisherman because my grandmother, after losing her, her husband and her oldest son, had to uh, made him promise he would never become a fisherman. So that's basically my sea story. Uh, my grandfather retired. Uh, nobody else went into the yachting business. Uh, those of you may know, my uncle, my uncle Roy was a fireman for a number of years. Uh, and Sp I'm no know if anybody knew Spike Bassett Senior, but he was a piece of work. He worked for the town. Uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. That wasn't, they weren't crew members, Val, they were pirates. <laughs> <laughs> I knew your uncle very well. I worked with him. Which uh, one? I, Roy. Roy. But I, also, I, also want, I also wanted to know, uh, can you hear me? I yeah. Also, yeah. I also wanted to know, what happened to all the booze in Osborne's store? The question drank it all. <laughs> by the time, by the time um, the... Uh, Prohibition was over. They took it all back and then they stocked up. And, uh, and those were my years working at Osborne's from 1956 to 19, when I graduated from college in 64. Yeah. And I would be down illegally in the uh, liquor <laughs> basement because us kids were shorter than the adults. and. I think I think as a grandchild to all of that, we were all down walking through there, and we were all eight, nine, ten years old, moving boxes because they would stand up at the top of the conveyor belt that they had built in, and they'd be telling yeah. you, um, you know, go over and get that and put that on the conveyor because they didn't want to come down because their backs hurt so bad. Oh, I know. My father worked there a couple of years after World War II, before yeah. he went to work for the post office. He was in charge of produce. No, no, he had the liquor store. Well, he was, I see he was in charge of produce a lot. And they, yeah, shared, well, they all, they everybody, did, the everybody did a little of everything. That's right. That's but, right. Uh, the, be, the best part is to, being, a, being a little kid there, you could, uh, you could run around the back of the counter at, in the liquor store and jump down the hatch and be in the basement in a, in a second. They, <laughs> all, they, they also had this roasted peanut thing at the <laughs> end of the, at the end of the counter. And that, you know, they, they, uh, every time you went in there to get something, you know, you always stuck your hand in, double dipping into the peanuts. And uh, you could always tell when Bill Chapman was in there because the side of his uniform where he stuffed the peanuts in his pocket had a big grease stain on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the ironic thing about working at Honest Ones, it has nothing to do with the waterfront, was I'm working there one day, first day I'm working there. I'm 14 years old, and this woman comes up to me and she asked me if I was Val Dumas's kid. That's how my father was known from the Czech Republic, to Val Dumas. And uh, she said to me, "Are you Val Dumas's kid?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, you know, I'm still single because I'm still in love with your father." 
<laughs> <laughs> my mind went, what? Because, you know, at 14, you figure your father, your father only went out with your mother, right? You never dated anybody else. So after she left, I asked um, Trucko Chapman if that was a true story, because they had all hung around together. And he said, yes, it was. And uh, well, I went have from, more respect for my father after that. I, I went from Osborne's to the waterfront because I told my great grandfather one day, I said, you know, I really don't like working here inside. And he kind of looked at me funny and he said, okay. He said, I said, I really like it down around the waterfront. And I had been going to Crocker Park and the transportation company. And I knew kids that worked for Rody Millmore and Phil Clark. And Phil Clark was my great grandfather's cousin. And so he said, why don't you go down and talk to Phil Clark and tell him I sent you down. So a couple of days later, I rode my bike down and I got down there and there were guys like Johnny Wolfgram and Bruce Chapman sitting on the rail of one of the gangways. And apparently that was the perch that everybody sat until a boat came in and then it was all hands on deck and do what you had to do, whether it was, and in that days, give them ice tie them up, give them white, diesel, white fuel for their marine engines. Uh, and so I was walking around and this stubby little guy who I thought looked like Popeye at the time came out and said, um, you must be Norris's great grandson. And I looked and I said, yes, sir. He says, well, I'm Phil Clark. And I said, okay, Mr. Clark. He says, no, not Mr. Clark. He said, I'm Phil. I said, okay. He said, and what you can do is, oh, I think I lost you. No, you're still, still here. No, we got you. And what I had to do was, he said, well, follow me around for a little bit. And we went over and looked at the boats. And they were greasing the skids for some boat to go down the railway. And I hauled some ice. And I said, after it was all over, he said, well, why don't you come down tomorrow around 7 o'clock? He said, and you can work until 1 o'clock. I did. And after that, it was a labor of love. I couldn't leave that place. I worked there until after I graduated from high school. I went down after school. I painted gangways in the shop. And my best, best friend was Carl McGee. I don't, most of you know who Carl McGee was. I know Norm does. Uh, <laughs> a character, uh, probably one of the characters. And he loved my Volkswagen. I had an old Volkswagen that I bought for a buck. And it burned more oil than it did gas. And he took the front seat out and put boat hook snaps that you put on the side side rails of a boat to snap the boat hook into the rail and put them, screwed them to the floor, took the, all this stuff off the seat and snapped the front driver's seat back in the car. So he would hop in the car, take the seat out and drive it from the back seat. So you'd see Carl going up the street, going up State Street and all you'd see would be these big long arms going by the uh, window. Norm Vincent at the time, didn't like the car because it made too much noise. And of course, he was the mayor of State Street and used to complain to the cops every time I drove up State Street that I didn't have a muffler. Well, I had a muffler, but I just hadn't put it on that day. But back to working on the wharf, it was quite a place. You had guys like Ray Till, Bud Bowden, who formed the Cheap Bastard Yacht Club because the CBYC would go for an annual cruise, which was a bunch of old retired guys. And I shouldn't say it that loosely or disrespectful because I'm not, uh, would climb aboard Horton Brown's boat and go for a cruise to Manchester, come back, sit out on the boat, have lunch, and then they came ashore. And that was the annual cruise for the CBYC. And Jack the Ripper started making little stickers, CBYC stickers, and that's where they originated. And But at the time when they started, they were numbered. And I can remember for years and years, and I wish I still had, I had number 15. Uh, Number one through 10 was reserved for the board of directors who sat on the bench in front of the transportation company every afternoon and told you what you were doing wrong. Uh, it, was, it was really, it was quite an experience. And I also, from time to time, would work for Watson Curtis because Watson and my father were very good friends. And if he didn't have a crew uh, to go out with George Berry and empty the two mackerel nets that were out, one at Cat Island and one at um, Tinker's Island, he'd be looking for kids to go out and help him. So I, every once in a while, I'd go out there first thing and had to be there at 3.30 and be back to the wharf in time um, to work my shift from seven to one to three, whatever it was that I had to do that day. But it was quite the experience. I mean, you couldn't teach kids um, 
a work ethic, but boy, you learned it the hard way when you worked on the other side of the harbor. Uh, it was a great experience. I, I remember every little bit of it to this day. And working at the transportation company was just something else as a kid. And there were a lot of kids that went through that place. Yep, there it is. That's um, Azer Goodwin's boat from Barney Gap. I can tell you right now. And see that if you look at the green gangway up at the top, there's like a little um, red entryway and everybody used to sit on that railing. Look at the old gas pumps. Wow. <laughs> Great picture, Jack. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got another one here. Hold on. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, Shammy Graves, Walter Williams, Marvin Turner in the middle, Shammy pouring into Marvin Turner. I'm not sure who the other two guys are, but someone mentioned that in the picture when it was brought up on Facebook. And if you look at the old pumps up in the rack above it, those that's what you use when you cleaned out the skiffs and replenished the oars. You took the oars out of them and kept them up there. They called those pumps, uh, and I'm not, <laughs> they, they call That's those safe. Pumps, You're okay. They call those pumps guinea pumps because they used to use them on all the fish, all the Italian fishing boats down in Gloucester, and that's where they came out of. There was a guy down in Gloucester that used to make them. Uh, he was a tin knocker. They were all metal, and formed and banged and hammered with a wooden pump handle on it that had a leather diaphragm at the bottom. So just, you know, a little piece of history, but that was the inside of the transportation company for many, many years. So with all the, with all the gear that I see hanging on the, the rods that are horizontal and the Plymouth rope sign, that must have been a splicing bench right behind them that they're leaning on? Actually, there were two there. Um, Collie Ca Williams, the guy with the pipe in his mouth, was probably one of the best splices there was uh, that I ever saw as far as, you know, when something on there, it looked like a piece, it was a piece of art. It was artwork, and it was a it was a craft. So there was people that could do it right, and there were people that could made it a craft and made it nice. But yeah, it was really something. Hi, Norm. <laughs> Norm, uh, you're still muted. Hold on one second. Hold on. We'll get you here. Hold on one Bear second. Bear with me. Come on. Where? Hold on, Norm. Bear with me. <laughs> Okay, Norm, you're live. Um, we're missing one name to the uh, transportation. Bill Connolly. Yeah, oh, definitely. Bill Connolly. Oh. <laughs> he talks about it all the time. And boy, he was one of the best down there too. I was probably, I came in after, shortly after the Bill Connolly era of that generation of guys working down there. But they certainly laid things out for you in the way that things were done. And, Bill was the master. I mean, Bill worked on the police boat. Uh, I remember going to a fire when there was a problem down in the harbor and the police boat had to respond. The first place they'd go would be to run by the front of the dock at the transportation company. And whoever was there jumped on to help the guy who was usually alone on the police boat. Well, there was a boat that blew up down the Haley's down beside the current Boston Yacht Club area in the old um, Marine, uh, what the heck was the name? Haley's Marine. Uh, and I happened to jump on the police boat with Carl and we got the pump going and there's a picture of the three of us, me, Bill Conley and Carl. Conley was a call fireman at the time. Yes, he was. Happened to get there, probably one of the first guys there. Loved it because it was on the water and it was a boat. And um, he's down there, he's got his hand over the gas tank of the boat that was full while the front of the boat was still on fire and everybody's yelling at him, you damn fool, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was doing the right thing. He didn't let the fumes out of the gas tank and we put the fire out. So that was, everybody used to get on him about that. You know, he, I guess he pretty much pushed a couple of firemen aside to go because it was a boat. So, yeah, Bill Conley was a great one down oh, yeah. there. He's a good friend. And, he is, and Bill has um, come up with, he's done a lot of writing about the transportation company and police boats. And um, I've been very, very boat, fortunate. The and the yeah, the ferry, the ferry boats. boats. He did the ferry boats. And part of the things when you were indoctrinated at the transportation company was you were a purser on the ferry boat on Saturday and Sundays when it was busy. And boy, that was just so cool. I mean, you'd fill that ferry boat every trip Sunday afternoon for people to ride around the harbor. And it was 10 cents. You collected 10 cents as they came on board. And you had to have a pair of chino pants on and a nice t-shirt. 
or you didn't work on the ferry boat. So it was pretty cool. We also used to take the kids out to Children's Island. Uh, the ferry boats we used to take the kids out, um, take them out and bring them in. And it was really funny because I can remember every morning when you went to work, the first guy there went out with the guys on the ferry boat to take the kids to Children's Island. And Carl McGee would holler, it's time to take the little bastards out to Camp Runamuck. <laughs> And if, and if you know Kyle McGee, that was, that was just the way he was, and he said everything just about that way. Yep. Wow. See, Sham, I, I, think, I think that's Shammy on the far left, isn't it? Uh, was head down yeah, low? Maybe not. Be. Yeah, could be. Is this on the wharf on the transportation that's, company? That's right at the transportation. That's the rail. Oh, okay. Where they used to stand and tell you you were doing something wrong. <laughs> not not a piece of fiberglass in that harbor right there either. I don't no, think. there isn't. No. Looks like that's Phil Clark's old Dodge Skylark sitting in the front here with the blue one. Everybody learned how to drive on that car because we drove it across the parking lot every once in a while. So it was pretty cool growing up down there. I mean, you really, you can't learn a work ethic, but you can certainly pick one up. And you worked around a whole bunch of guys that did it that way. So I guess... From the other side of the harbor, Norm, I guess. And we respected all of you guys, too, and you guys all respected what we did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Is anybody else questions, comments on for Wayne or Frank or Norm or Val or anybody? Or anybody want to add anything new? I don't see any hands. I, but... I have a quick story. Oh, okay, Maureen, go for it. About a personality that we haven't talked about, which is Augie Wolfgram, who was the harbor master. Um, back in the early 80s, I was a sailing instructor for the town of Marblehead, and we taught on Salem Harbor. We started out at um, um, Village Street Pier or Besson's Beach area, but then they moved us down to Stramski's because I think they thought we would be less trouble. And there was no pier down there, so we had an offshore float, and we had a pull mooring, and so we would every day row out and get our little uh, motorboat, and we'd come in, and we'd ferry the kids out to our little float, but we were teaching on widgeons, which were a very light boat. I don't know, the boats might have weighed 200 pounds. So the fittings on our float were very light because they only had to hold such a small boat. Well, on the weekend, I guess Augie uh, sometimes would get out to stretch his legs, him and his dog on our float, and he tied up his boat to our float and uh, our cleats weren't very sturdy and his boat let go and started drifting away. And I think he had to get the police boat to come rescue his boat. He, he took a lot of guff for that. So that day he got on the phone with our boss, Tom Hammond. Come Monday morning, we were all instructed that our top priority was to install stronger cleats on there because they didn't want that happening again. Um, but we called him Mr. Wolfgram. We would never get away with calling him Augie. But he was our nemesis as sailing Marie, instructor. Marie, he was always complaining. You? Can I correct you for a minute? Sure. Augie Wolfram wasn't the harbor master. He always introduced himself as Augie Wolfram, and this is my dog, Og Dog. He's the harbor master. As, and that was just one of the, he did that to, Norm, he did that to George O'Day at the Eastern Yacht Club one day. Yeah. <laughs> George O'Day came down and put his hand out, and he said, I'm George O'Day. And Augie shook his hand, and he said, I heard you're the harbor master. And Augie turned to him, and he says, I'm not the harbor master. He is, pointing to the dog. So. Yeah. <laughs> Ogdog, uh, Augie and Ogdog, there's some just tremendous stories and pictures that yeah. abound about them. And they were, yeah, great, great guy. I mean, he, he was a great guy. He was a little bit gruff, but uh, that was his way. Everybody on the water was gruff at from time to time. <laughs> That's how you learn. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I'm no going to say, I never came out gruff no more, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Norm, what, you had a hand raised? I, I always look at Ted Hood. Um, I think he probably, of anybody that I can think of, has had the biggest trickle-down effect of people and money here in Marblehead. And I, I have to look at, personally, I came from Beverly, I was 19 years old, I'm now 82, I've been here for years. My wife is in real estate business. My son is, lives here. My daughter lives here. My grandchildren, all this trickle down from 
being a 19 year old coming into Marblehead and financially what we've done in this business and I can go, we can go through a litany of people here in Marblehead and it all, we're all here because of Ted Hood. And it, he probably has had more, uh, I'm gonna say, I don't know how to explain it. Again, that trickle down of all the people that have come here, uh, have worked here and have contributed to the town of Marblehead, all from that one guy. I, I don't think he ever gets as much credit as he gets a lot. But, and unfortunately, we sometimes they say Ted left Marblehead. Uh, um, you know, he was going to wanted to put a marina down there at Riverhead Beach or one thing or another. The real thing was he went to Marblehead, uh, went to Rhode Island, as far as I'm concerned. Ted Hood went to Rhode Island because he couldn't have a big enough business here for that would include his wife, his daughter, and the three boys. He couldn't make that, didn't have a, enough space to do that. He had an opportunity to go to Rhode Island and that little harbor marina down there in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And, and it comes from, I believe, his father. His father always, it was a family business. His father, Ted, Bruce, and they all worked together. And now we came to the next generation, Ted and his four children. I, I always felt he went, he left Marblehead on a good note. A lot of people saw that Ted Hood, he left, or so on and so forth. But again, the, the financial and economic background that he has left in the town of Marblehead is just it's unbelievable. Just remember, Norm, we were here waiting for you. What's that? Just remember, we were here waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you. I got one more of the... The Queen. That's um, Queen. Kit Robinson uh, with a hat on. And I couldn't tell you who the guy is in the t-shirt, but if you see it's t-shirt and chinos, and that's a ride to Camp Runamuck. They also took kids out and came back in the afternoon. That's the and Kelpie. Bill Conley, Bill Conley tells me, that, yeah, that's the, the Kelpie with a roof. Yeah, it is. She used to not have a, originally didn't have a roof on yeah. it. She was, a, she was a work launch. I have a bow chuck off of the Kelpie, and it, the Kelpie has been disposed of in a very strange way. It's buried in a driveway over on Atlantic, over on Ocean Avenue, behind where the Elks Pool was. I watched them bury it, break it up and bury it, and it's underneath that driveway. And I have a bow chalk off of the Kelpie just while they were doing that. Wow. That, that other person uh, was uh, Dougie O'Leary. There you go. Kip You've got Robinson. it. That's right. Yeah. That was, Doug was a skipper on the, on the Queen for a long time. The uh, the story that I like that isn't being done anymore the way it was when I was a kid growing up on the water is the Sunset Cannon Fire at the three yacht clubs. Yeah, still goes by on. The end of the, by the end of the summer, the sequence was such that it, they would have it down so time so pat that it would sound like one cannon going off <laughs> rather than three. And uh, it was an ongoing competition amongst the uh, dock men at the different yacht clubs to uh, keep it synchronized. And it would take pretty much the whole summer to get it so that everybody could get it off as one big cannon fire. I like that. That's great. Anybody else raise your hand either virtually or physically. I'll see you before we end for the morning. I don't think I see any hands. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. If, you know, if we're still stuck at home in a month, we'll, we'll, we had a Memories Roadshow plan for the first Saturday in, um, in May, but I don't know that we'll be doing that. So I think what we'll probably do is um, come up with another theme. Uh, we'll let you know what that's going to be and we'll do this again. I think it worked really well. I appreciate you all um, joining us. And, um, and I think, I mean, I think I know everybody here and I think you're all members uh, and we really appreciate your membership. And if you're not, um, 
you know, you can always visit our website and join the museum. And there's also all sorts of other resources on, on the website, especially in the research section, if you're bored and you need something to do. We also have lectures and other things on our YouTube page. So I hope you can take advantage of those. And we so appreciate you uh, sharing everything with us today. So thank you all. Lauren, I'm, yeah. Lauren, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Yeah, and, um, I, and thanks for pitching the membership. Um, we're, we're, a lot of nonprofits, have, we mentioned Mystic Seaport. I read an article last week of them laying off 199 people because of what they base um, their, their finances in is education um, and programming. Um, we're very lucky that we're really membership driven. So. Um, spread the word of our organization, um, become a member if you're not, and, um, and we'll be here to, to keep sharing Marblehead history. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Marblehead thanks for being, the, Thank you. Thanks for being the first speaker, Norman. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs> stay safe. Stay home. I hope I can and, talk and, and wait, when we started, Norm, you were the only one that was going to speak. Marblehead, Marblehead forever. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Forever. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.